Hello everybody and welcome back to the Dragon's Library. So, I've been gone for a little while, I apologize, I had mic troubles and I've been trying to get some stuff ready. Hopefully when this video comes out I will have the new assets ready so you'll be seeing me as like a full dragon instead of a floating head, won't that be nice? There's a new background and I'm working on some other stuff. So I've been a little busy and then when I finally started to start working on this in the past week, my microphone just decided to stop working and I eventually had to reinstall the drivers and the audio interface so that was a whole thing. Anyway, moving on to the actual review. Today we're going to be talking about To the Bloody End by Rachel Aaron. Now this is the final part of Rachel Aaron's DFZ Changeling series. It is set in the same world as the Heart Striker series and also the Minimum Wage Magic DFZ series. In this book and in the previous two, we follow the new underground king and former changeling Lola Daniels, who attempts to take down her former blood mage master, Victor Conrath, who has ascended to pseudo godhood after a publicity stunt and finally killing the Wild Hunt. Now, for those of you who don't know, I am a huge fan of Rachel Aaron's DFZ books. I've reviewed the previous two books for this particular trilogy within the last year with very positive scores. And the DFZ, or Detroit Free Zone, is a fantastic setting with sort of a fantasy cyberpunk version of Detroit set in a world where magic returned in 2030. And that when magic returned, so did spirits. The spirit of the Great Lakes, Algonquin, rose up and destroyed the city as punishment for polluted waters. The actual series, starting with the Heart Striker books, The Nice Dragons Finish Last, take place starting in 2090 with the newer books such as this one set in the early 22nd century. After the first series, magic rose once more, growing even more powerful due to events that happened in the Heartstrikers, I won't spoil, but the gods have returned. These are basically, instead of magic forming in geographic formations or in large populations of animals, it formed in human beliefs. So there's like multiple gods of death, there's a god of ramen noodles, and there's the new god of the DFZ, which turned it into a living city of magic with moving buildings and all this stuff. It's a really cool setting. As I've said in previous reviews, I have always loved this concept concept of cyberpunk but with magic and it gives the book set in this world a very unique vibe. This is the kind of world where you have a god born of the human ideal of noodles make, running a ramen shop while dragons roam around the sky. Your date for the night could be a vampire and also you could have like cybernetic limbs and be a full dive VR hacker. It is a crazy setting where basically anything goes. It's a lot of fun and there's just so much to explore here, especially with the fact that almost everything is legal in the DFC. It's kind of like capitalist utopia gone mad. It was worse under Algonquin, but there are problems. And it creates this very interesting setting, especially when the city itself is personified as a god and she's trying to like improve herself through various people that live in her. It's very interesting. Rachel Aaron took this a step further after the first series, and now it seems like every new book is a whole new set of characters with only sparse background characters for the longtime fans of the previous books, which I like. Like Julius, the one of the main characters from the Heart Strider series, gets mentioned a bunch as the Peacemaker because he was like a big protagonist kind of protagonist in the first books. I like Julius a lot, but he's made like two cameos in the previous series, and he's only really talked about in name until the very end of the book, and you don't even have like a talking scene with him, it's just she worked with him at one point in the future. I also love it because Julius is like the most chill guy ever, and every time he gets mentioned in one of these books, people are like, it's the Peacemaker, you don't cross the Peacemaker, he has like the entire Dragon Alliance behind him. And we're still talking about Julius, right? The guy who freaks out about everything. I mean, I know he's gotten more confidence these days, if you guys just walked up and explained, like, he, he'd be chill. He'd be chill. Julius is great. <laughs> it, it just makes me laugh. So I really like the series, in case that wasn't obviously clear. And as a result, I do want to make my bias towards this author and the setting very clear. I really enjoy this stuff. And even if the book were subpar, I would probably still love it. However, it's not subpar, and I actually really enjoyed this one. Moving on to the plot itself, as I mentioned in my reviews of the previous entries, I have really enjoyed the exploration of the fairy magic and fae, as well as the blood magic that we had heard about previously. See, blood magic in particular was this taboo, only hinted at in previous entries. It's when mages rip magic from living creatures. It permanently taints their very soul. It makes it either harder or completely unable to draw magic naturally. So you're basically a parasite at that point. They're hunted down by paladins, who we only really saw that many of in the first book when they attacked the main character for working with Victor, because he was basically enslaving them. And Rachel Aaron has usually used this to good effect. It had this sort of like darker side to magic that we never really saw, but we knew it was there. And then we got to see it in this book. To the Bloody End did a good job at delivering a thrilling climax as well. 
Victor had been such a horrifyingly powerful blood mage, especially after his ascension, that, well, Rachel Aaron usually has her characters at a severe power disadvantage early on. But this is always offset by a major power boost in the third or near the end of the second book. This happens a lot of her installments, but I do like it as a way to start off small scale, but then escalate the threat while still making sure that they're not the most powerful person around. I mean, Julia's got like an anti-violence weapon, even if Marcy became a Merlin. Unfortunately for Lola, however, this book makes it very clear that raw power is not enough to pick down Victor. She's actually on par with him. I mean, the story starts with her blowing up his church in what is essentially the exploding shadow clone jutsu from Naruto. But because he ascended and became a pseudo-god, the belief of his followers keeps putting him back together. And once he makes a cable appearance, it becomes harder and harder to put him down because people believe, oh yeah, that definitely can't kill him because this event didn't kill him. He's literally feeding off the collective belief of mankind at this point, and even the people who don't like him aren't doing it. Now, I do want to touch on something that's actually very interesting. A lot of connected universe books always falter with this, and it's how do you make a threat powerful when there are all these powerful people who have dealt with dangerous threats? Darren Cross is going to unleash chaos upon the world. I think our first move should be calling the Avengers. You know, the spirits and dragons dealt with a universe devouring end in the Heartstriker series. Well, first up, the Blood Mage has imprisoned the god of the DFZ in a, you know, blood magic stuff. So all the gods are like, we don't want to get bound and are terrified to act aside from a handful, but they don't have the raw strength to. The Merlin Council is doing something. They're trying to, because Victor's a spirit, they're trying to banish him, but it's not working, but they're still trying stuff. The dragons are divided because one of them got elected as president of the United States and Julius is trying to stop him from trying to re-annex Detroit, which is a whole thing in itself. But it makes it very clear that all the major players from the previous books are around. They're trying to help with the situation, but the villain has outsmarted them here. And it's becoming very clear that Lola can't just take Victor on head to head. So as a result, she's forced to gather new allies, particularly the paladins and the other fairy monarchs, including the other fairy queen she knew, Morgan. I do enjoy how becoming this, you know, powerful fairy king hasn't actually stopped the plot. Like, it doesn't fix their problems. On terms of raw strength, Rola is on par with, or actually potentially stronger than Victor when it comes to the sheer amount of magic or gossamer she can throw around. But because everyone believes nothing can kill him, she can't make it stick. And because she's keeping her real body hidden in her barrow, every time he kills her, it doesn't stick either. So neither of them can kill each other, but they both have a bunch of power. So the main characters and the villain both have to act on essentially a propaganda war of sorts. They have to weaken the world's faith in their own invinci in Victor's invincibility, while Victor tries to weaken or strengthen that faith to the point where he'll get enough power where people just believe he can, just, you know, wipe his hands across the screen and fix everything. I really do like how the climax is essentially a giant stage performance where everyone's trying to out macho the other via tricks and schemes like. They're not even throwing around their actual powers at a certain point. They basically have just puffed themselves up and are putting on a show for everyone, which is very fitting for the house all started with Lola being turned into a monster that nothing could beat, just so Victor could swoop in and beat it for everyone. Very interesting, and I like how they kind of turned that on him. Now, while I do think this story is really good, it has this fast pace that makes you really feel like no time is wasted. There's always characters doing stuff. I liked Simon's redemption arc. I liked what Valente got to become, finally a true urban legend and all that. On the other hand, I do have some minor nitpicks. These are pretty minor, and I think they're more gonna be a problem going on forward for the series rather than a problem with this book specifically. See, I'm starting to get the pattern of her stories, of Rachel Aaron's stories. You get a general formula of helper's protagonist becomes a badass eventually, DFC has some kind of catastrophe, villain defeated for their own mortal failings, making them blind to their true weakness, main character sets up shop in the DFC afterwards to become a new pillar of the community to be referenced in later books and also build out the world a bit more. Now this isn't a bad formula, and quite, quite frankly it has a lot of flexibility, but I do want to maybe not have the DFC turn to ruins, and the book itself calls this out, it's not just me saying this. The DFC is like, yeah, people aren't going to want to move back if I keep getting blown up every few years. I don't think this is really a problem at the moment, like I said earlier, but I do think that focusing on a smaller scale conflict in any future DFZ series will help alleviate this escalation problem that might eventually become an issue. We can still have a series like the Changeling of Heartstrikers where, you know, the world is threatened or the DFZ as a whole is threatened, but I kind of really did like the DFZ series' more 
down to earth and small scale conflict, which was kind of like a family drama. Yeah, the DFC was being threatened by a new intruding god who was trying to muscle in on her turf. But the main tr thing with Opal was her father and their issues and white snakes and all that. So I liked that, that narrower focus on smaller scale conflict. And I think a few more of those between these like massive big fights could help if Rachel Aaron does continue to work in this world, lessen the escalation problem that'll eventually result. At this point, you've got, you know, a fairy monarch, the dragon who has the alliance with like 99% of the world's dragons, and also the Merlin Council, who are the mages who partnered with actual gods all in one city. Uh, it makes sense, it's the magical capital of the world in this world, but maybe like, don't try and threaten it with destruction again, because you're gonna be really clever to make that truly stick. Still, I would really like to find out more people's lives in this world. Maybe some apprentice to a new god's priesthood, or just random bits. There's so much you could do in the setting, and I really hope Rachel Aaron continues to explore it. So, in case it wasn't very obvious, this gets an easy 10 out of 10 for me. I would most likely recommend you listen to the Audible version instead of reading the physical book. I really loved the voice actor, Naomi Rose Mock. She did a great job with this. And, yeah. I love this book. It's urban fantasy, which is one of my favorite subgenres, and Rachel Aaron just brings so much life and personality into her characters. They're so interesting and energetic, and none of them really seem boring. Like, Victor is a sleazy con artist. You really believe he could worm his way into anyone's soul. I loved Simon's quest for redemption, his desolation, and eventually kind of redemption arc. So, yeah. Moving on from there, we have the announcements. Now, I've been absent a while, explained at the beginning of the review, not gonna go over that again, but we do have stuff that's coming up. Yes, I'm gonna try and get more reviews out to make up for all the time I've lost. I'm not sure if I'm gonna be able to. I don't always abide by those promises I make, apologize. This is kind of a secondary thing for me. But I am working on a review for the Hasbin Hotel and the Monsterverse, the Monarch Legacy of Monsters thing. In addition to that, we also have the Percy Jackson series by Disney Plus, which came out. That's all the things I have like on the docket immediately, but Prince of Persia, The Lost Crown is being streamed right now, so look forward to a review about that eventually. Moving on from there, we have the out card. There's a subscribe board. Click on it, go to my channel and subscribe. There's a video you recommends, and I'm gonna have something in this other card, not sure what. I might just do start a playlist for all the stuff I do this year with this video being the first thing in there. See you guys next time. Bye.